Welcome to the Financial Planning Certification Exam Lessons Podcast. This is going to be a sample lesson of the full series of audio lessons which are available at the website fplessons.com. That means financialplanninglessons.com, fplessons.com. At the website, you can find the full series of audio lessons. The full series of audio lessons consists of six different sections. Those sections include general financial planning principles, professional conduct and regulation, insurance planning and insurance products, investment planning, tax planning, retirement savings and income planning, and finally estate planning. A total of six different sections. You can buy the individual sections at the website fplessons.com. Or if you want to save a lot of money, you can buy the full series of audio lessons in a single bundle. All right, let's get on to this sample lesson. This is audio lessons for the financial planning certification exam, part two, insurance, risk management, and employee benefits. This is lesson three, domains. Welcome to this lesson about the financial planning exam. So today we are going to be talking about the different domains that you'll be expected to know. There's eight of these and they're all different phases of financial planning. So they're really important to understand. And so we're gonna go through all of those today with a detailed explanation of what uh, happens at each stage and also give you uh, a situation that we can talk about so that you can uh, see how this applies in a real situation. At the end, I will still give you a chance to test yourself, to review what you've learned and to see whether you are ready to go on to the next lesson. So today we're taking a deep dive into the heart of what it means to be a certified financial planner by exploring the eight major domains that define the profession. And now these domains, it's important to realize, are not just terms in a textbook. They're the very foundation of, in which a career as a financial planner rests. They represent the essence of your relationship with clients from the first handshake to ongoing check-ins with the client that ensure their financial health and success. So let's start with the first one and we're going to talk about what each of these domains entails. So starting off, we have domain one, which is called establishing and defining the client partner relationship. So imagine this domain as the cornerstone of trust. It's where you and your client outline the expectations for your relationship and agree upon how you are going to work together. This involves clearly explaining and documenting all of the services to be provided, defining responsibilities, and then of course setting the duration of the engagement. So is this going to be a long-term thing? Is this just for a, a short term? There was some big life event and now they need some help in the short term. Or is this something that they, they want you to do on an ongoing basis? So say manage your retirement on an ongoing basis. So it's like setting the terms of a partnership where both parties understand and respect their roles. You might wonder why is this the first step? And the answer is quite simple, trust. Establishing trust from the get-go is crucial. It's during these initial conversations that you'll clarify your responsibilities, also ensure transparency about your fee. You don't want that to get into an argument later about compensation, of course, and discuss the boundaries of confidentiality. So some people might want to share more or less information with you, depending on the kind of transaction it is. If you're dealing with somebody's retirement, uh, you're going to need quite a bit of information about them, and that includes a lot of personal stuff so that you might need to know, for example, about their medical history and whatnot. So those boundaries will be clearly defined in this domain. 
Now remember, it's like setting the foundation of a house. If the foundation is solid, this trust that you're building, the structure that's built on top of it is more likely to stand firm and to weather any problems that might come. Your uh, metaphorical hurricanes and earthquakes. So that's the first domain, establishing the client partner relationship and defining it. Now let's move on to the second domain. The second domain is gathering information necessary to fulfill the engagement. So think of this step as putting together the pieces of a puzzle. You need to gather all the pieces to make sure that you'll be able to put them together. You're going to need quite a few pieces. And of this case, pieces of information about your client. This includes understanding your client's personal and financial objectives, their needs, their priorities, and any other relevant information about your client. Yes, the more information that you can get, the better. The better you understand your client, the more accurately you are going to be able to advise them when the time comes. And, and it's important that the client realizes this too. If they are knowingly holding something back, that would be really, really important for you when you're making your decisions. They're only harming your ability to give them good advice. Let's say that your client is asking you to help them plan for retirement, but they're actually not disclosing to you that they have a serious medical condition. Now, that, that's going to be a huge factor in trying to plan for retirement. You need to think about those medical expenses and where you're going to live and what equipment you're going to need. And if you have your life insurance in place, if things don't go well, yeah, all these different things that you wouldn't consider in the same way if you were dealing with a perfectly healthy client. So explain that to the people you're working with, that you really do need to know as much as you can so that you can help them as much as possible. So you're not just collecting data. You are laying the groundwork for a roadmap tailored to their unique financial journey. This is like the detective phase. You'll ask for documents, tax returns, account statements, and so forth. But most importantly, you also need to understand not just the numbers and the papers and uh, what the balance sheets say, but you need to understand what their goals and their uh, fears are, well, what they're afraid of, what they're trying to avoid. You want to ask them, all right, what are you looking forward to? Are you trying to buy a home, for example? Uh, do you want to make sure you can send your kids to college at a particular place? Are you trying to retire early by having enough so that you can maintain your lifestyle even when you retire? It's in these dreams and aspirations where you find the real motivation that's behind their financial goals. So if you just look at the balance sheets and the income and outgo and crunch the numbers, that's only telling part of the story. It's important uh, to do your detective work and to consider everything that you need, to, that you can learn about your client. So once you've got all of your data, it's time for domain three, which is analyzing and evaluating the client's current financial state. So this is the analytical part where you determine the client's financial status. You look for strengths and weaknesses. You spot both opportunities and potential threats. And you say like, oh, well, you've got a lot of things tied up in real estate. Well, that's uh, that's good when the real estate market is good, but if that turns down, you might lose money. That could be a threat. It's not as liquid as you might like if, if you need to be able to get cash out quickly, if there's an emergency, so we're gonna diversify a little bit, that sort of thing. It's a deep dive that ensures that you fully grasp the, their financial reality before crafting a plan. It's essential to maintain an objective lens while you're doing this. Uh, it's always easier to focus on what's going well. You can say, oh, you know, it's this is this looks good. You've got a lot of savings that you've got a diversified portfolio and whatnot. But it's also vital to acknowledge areas that need improvement or that pose potential risks. 
And now that can be hard to talk about a little bit because your, your client may not want to hear necessarily some of these risks and problems. But if you're going to do your job well, you need to inform them about risks and problems and in the context of how are we going to overcome and avoid these. So as long as you couch it in that context, that is not you're not just criticizing them, you're really pointing them out because you want to help them. That will go over a lot better than just pointing them out. With that clear picture in mind, after you've done your detective work and you've ascertained what the current financial situation of the person is, we move on to developing the recommendation. This is domain four. This is where your expertise gets to shine. You get to make recommendations. Based on your analysis, you'll craft a series of financial recommendations, creating a strategy that aligns with your client's goals, timelines, and risk tolerance. So you, you decide, okay, or they're trying to build a house and they need to raise money for that. They'd like to have it done within the next few years. And the risk tolerance is somewhat high because they are young and they still have a lot of time to work on their investments. So that sort of thing. You have to take all of those things into account. It's like drawing a map that leads the, your client from where they are now to where they want to go. You could also think about it like sculpting. With each recommendation, you're shaping and molding the financial future of your client in a certain way. But remember that while your expertise is vital, it should also incorporate the client's comfort levels. The best strategies are those tailored to the client's unique psyche and circumstances. So if they really don't have a high risk mentality, high risk, high reward, they don't have that risk tolerance. It's even if you think it's a good idea, you can tell them that, but you shouldn't just override their wishes and say, well, we're going to do this, even though it makes you really, really nervous. You know, that that's eroding the, the relationship of trust you have with your client. So figure out where they are on that continuum and tailor your game plan accordingly. And then it comes to domain five, which is very critical, communicating the recommendation. It doesn't do you any good to write up the recommendation if you don't communicate it clearly. If they don't understand what's going on, it's not going to help anyone. If you're a football coach and you, you come up with a brilliant play, but then don't communicate it well to your players, uh, it's not going to be effective on the field, so to speak. This isn't just about presenting a plan. It's about breaking it down, explaining the rationale that's really important so that they, they see where you're coming from, and ensuring your client understands the path forward. So it's the what, but it's also the why. They're much more likely to go along with your recommendations if they understand how you got to those recommendations in the first place. Communication is key, as the most effective plans are those that clients are comfortable with and that they can fully comprehend. Communicating the recommendation, remember that this is not just a monologue. You're not just standing there and giving a lecture and they just have to sit there and, and listen and take notes or something. You can encourage questions. You, it needs to be a dialogue between you and your client. Be patient with them and willing to rephrase or revisit certain areas. So rephrasing is always a good thing in a conversation. You say, so if I understand you correctly, what you meant was, and then rephrase what they said to check for understanding. Because remember, the goal isn't just to convey information, but to foster understanding between you. And if they have questions, you need to address those. If you just steamroll over them, once again, that's going to hurt that relationship of trust. And they're less likely to trust you and to continue the relationship or to give you more business in the future if they have another need. So that's really important. Remember that trust is paramount during all eight domains. So up next is phase six, which is the action phase, implementing the recommendation. It's one thing to draft a strategy, of course, but it's another to set it in motion. 
You've already created the blueprint for what you would like to do. But here, you and the client decide on the best steps to take, and then you assist them in making the necessary moves, whether it's adjusting portfolios, making different investments, or any other financial action. So you, you still have your game plan, you say, okay, first we're gonna do this, then this, and then, so in order to do that, uh, I, I need you to sign these forms, we need to do X, Y, and Z, whatever. Implementation is where the rubber meets the road. Here, your client will look to you for guidance on executing the strategy, is that a lot of these things they probably won't know how to do on their own. Whether it's setting up a new account, starting an investment, or relocating assets, your expertise is a guiding light for them and will ensure that things go well, as well as possible. You can never ensure success, of course, but with your help, things can go as smoothly as they possibly can. And then we continue. You, you can't just stop there. We go on to domain seven, which is monitoring the recommendation. So financial planning isn't just a one and done deal. Say, okay, invest here, invest here, open this account, and the end. <laughs> Take out this insurance policy, you'll be fine. Over time, you'll need to revisit the plan and evaluate it. And Almost always, your initial things aren't going to be 100% accurate or what you want to do. You need to be open to making adjustments for changes in circumstances. The, the lives of your clients can change. Say, hey, they, they had a serious illness in the family, and now we need to take that into account. Or somebody began military service and is no longer living there. So we have to take that into account. So you have to ensure that your client remains on track. And so that will, that might mean making adjustments as needed. That doesn't mean that your initial plan wasn't good, but life and especially finances are quite unpredictable. And so there's no shame in adjusting your plan in order to make things work a little bit better. This is your commitment to long-term success. You're not just a one and done, I'll help you once and then hands off. This is showing, hey, you can trust me because I'm going to guide you every step of the way and not just at the beginning. So that can create a lot more confidence in your clients. And then finally, we get to the eighth domain and it's all about integrity. So this is less of a, a step and more something that should inform all of the other domains, how you handle yourself. That the domain is called practicing with professional and regulatory standards. Adhering to ethical guidelines and keeping up with regulations ensures that you're not only a financial planner, but you are a trusted professional who prioritizes your client's best interests. You have a fiduciary interest in your clients, which means you are trying to act not in your own best self-interest, but in the client's best financial interests. Life is quite dynamic. Markets fluctuate, personal situations change, and goals evolve. Uh, part of these regulatory standards are conducting regular check-ins, reviews, and adjustments in order to assure long-term success. That's as part of your ethical duty is not to be hands-off but to closely monitor the situation. So these eight domains serve as a blueprint for excellence in financial planning, guiding your growth and your relationship with clients. Beyond just the regulations, it's important to follow these to uphold the reputation of the profession and to ensure your client's confidence in your ethics and expertise. In order to do this, you might need to do things to stay updated, attending seminars, participating in continuous learning in order to make sure that you know all of the latest things that are best practices. All right, so now that we've talked about the eight domains, let's talk about a situation, a fictional situation with a client where we demonstrate how you would go through all eight domains. So let's just call this client Sarah. Sarah is a 35-year-old woman who's stepping into your office. 
He's recently come into an inheritance and is overwhelmed with all of the choices that lie ahead. So this is where we get into domain one. You set the stage for Sarah, explaining how you'll guide her, detailing all of your fees in a transparent way, so how much, how much you'll be taking, and discussing how often the two of you will check in with each other. You get to know her a little bit and her situation and her, her fears and her hopes and everything in between. So that's domain one. Now diving into domain two with Sarah, you discover she's passionate about supporting environmental causes, and she also wants to buy a home in the next little bit. These aspirations give depth to the numbers and the documents that she provides. It's not just about where the money will go, but how it aligns with her values and her aspirations. As you transition into domain three, you notice that Sarah has some high interest debts that need addressing. So this is a, a potential risk or problem area. While she's keen on investing, you identify the immediate need to tackle the debt to free her from the shackles of compounding interest. So say, okay, well, you might want to go and buy that house right away with your, inher your inheritance, you know, using that as a down payment or whatever, but you really should tackle this high interest debt first so that you're not in a bad situation once you get there. With a clear analysis, you step into domain four and you craft a strategy. You recommend a mix of debt repayment, a savings plan for her dream home, and sustainable investments aligning with her passion for the environment. In domain five, Sarah, like many clients, needs clarity. She's new to all this financial jargon that you're throwing around. So you break down the complex terms, you use charts and visuals, you frequently ask if she's comfortable with each step that you're taking. It's a dialogue, ensuring that Sarah isn't just nodding along, but that she's genuinely grasping the plan that you have for her financial future. Domain six sees Sarah excitingly taking the first steps. She starts an investment in a green fund. She sets up an automatic payment to reduce her debt month on month and opens a savings account for her future home. Your guidance ensures that each move is executed seamlessly. Months fly by and now you're on the domain seven phase with Sarah. During your check-in, you learn that she's got a promotion. This positive change warrants adjustments in her financial strategy that showing the dynamic nature of financial planning. You say, all right, you're getting, you have more money coming in so we can increase the amount of money each month that is going into each of these categories. And so you decide, let's adjust these in a certain way. And once you're happy with that, you move forward with your new plan. And finally, throughout your relationship with Sarah, domain eight underscores every interaction. You update her about new regulatory changes you, and ensure her that your investments remain compliant with all any new rules that come up. Your commitment to professional growth assures Sarah that she's in capable, ethical hands. So you see how that works? It's really this, this journey that you go on with your client. And these steps are just a logical way to lead them on that journey in a way that builds trust and shows competence. And though this is a fictional account, it mirrors the experience of many clients. It emphasizes the importance of each domain, not just as a checklist or a step in the process, but as a touch point in someone's life. These are big things for, for the people involved. You have to remember, the role of a financial planner is multifaceted. Beyond just crunching your numbers, it's about this human connection that you make with people, understanding their aspirations, uh, using your empathy to put yourself in their shoes, and to being someone who can lead them through an intricate world of finance. Each domain is like a chapter in a client's financial story. And as a planner, you have the privilege of writing that story with them. Okay, so that is all that we're going to talk about in our lesson today. So let's end by doing some review questions and see how you do. If you're doing well, go ahead and move on. My first question is, what is the primary objective of the first domain? That's establishing and defining the client partner relationship. So in this case, it's trust. That is laying that foundation of trust by explaining everything in great detail and making sure that you're not hiding the ball in anything. So what 
what does it mean in the second domain to understand the client's personal and financial objectives, needs, and priorities? What sort of questions will you be asking them? All right, so you're going to talk about things like their risk tolerance, what their goals are. Are there certain things they're trying to invest in? Are there certain things they want to avoid? Are there certain values that they have that are important in their financial futures? There's certain things they want to invest in because they believe in them, that sort of thing. Why is it important to conduct an analysis and evaluation of a client's current financial state before making any recommendations? So in this case, it's just important to see both their strengths and their weaknesses. You need to be able to plan for both. Say, let's capitalize on what you're doing well, and let's make a plan to improve where you're not doing well. You know, it's like in the Sarah example where they said, oh, look, you've got a lot of high interest debt. Let's go ahead and, and make a plan to get that paid off so that that doesn't become a bigger problem in the future. So what are some ways when you're presenting a strategy that you can ensure that your client fully understands? So in this case, make sure that it's not a monologue. You're not just sitting there and talking at them. Uh, you can use visuals and charts and graphs give them something to look at so that it makes it easier to digest these complex bits of information, formulas and whatnot. It's also important that you just check for understanding and you rephrase what they're saying to you. Make sure that they're asking questions and you check their understanding and vice versa to make sure that everybody is on the same page. So how does the implementation domain differ from the recommendation development domain? So in the recommendation development domain, uh, you're just making the blueprint. You're deciding, okay, we're going to do this and that, open this account and make this investment. And in the implementation domain, you're actually doing it. You're going out and actually opening the accounts and helping them through all of these processes. So in the context of helping someone through their financial journey, why is monitoring an, um, an ongoing and dynamic process? So in this case, life changes a lot for people over the years. They might get married or divorced or have new children or get sick or get a new job or lose their job. All of these things are going to affect their financial plan. So it's not enough to just say one done. You have to help them over time and you have to monitor and readjust as necessary. My next one is describe the significance of adhering to professional and regulatory standards in the world of financial planning. Why is that essential? So it all goes back to that trust idea that if you are adhering to those plans, then the people are going to see that you're a professional, you're, that you are someone that can be trusted and you will have a good reputation and will give uh, financial planning as a whole, a better reputation. And you'll avoid getting in trouble, of course. Those are all of the questions I have. How did you do? If you did well, go ahead and move on. If not, review this lesson before continuing. And that's all for this lesson for today. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for listening. The full series of audio lessons, if you're interested, is available at fplessons.com fplessons.com. Best of luck in your studies.